Activate Your Introvert, the weekly show to help leaders build performance by understanding introversion. In this week's show, giving feedback. As a manager, you probably have to do it, but many of us do it badly and with no permission. How might you consider introverts when giving feedback? A discussion with Jeremy Nicholas. Jeremy is a humour coach and speaker mentor. He's also one of the best speakers and MCs that I've had the pleasure to watch on stage and laugh with. And he's got a long history of being a broadcaster at the BBC. And question of the week. Are introverts aloof? Just before speaking to Jeremy though, the latest new acronym I saw in the news this week, FOMO, the fear of missing out, is now old hat. People are suffering from HOGO, the hassle of going out. It's especially affecting restaurateurs at the moment who are experiencing a wave of no-shows owing to people deciding they can't face leaving the house after all. The group Gusto Italian said its 12 restaurants had a thousand no-shows in the last week alone. Let's hope that changes before Christmas. Personally, it just seemed like rudeness to me. I also saw a piece by James Marriott in The Times in praise of indifference. As James said, few things are as oppressive as compulsory enthusiasm. Nobody familiar with office life will have managed to avoid the absurd pantomime of excitement which now attends almost all corporate activities. Hear, hear. He then went on to say, authentic enthusiasm has its place, but we must not be afraid of indifference, which nowadays looks positively like a virtue. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been accused of being introverted because I don't show as much enthusiasm. Well, perhaps James is saying, that's okay. And finally, one that made me laugh in the news. Did you read about the cryptocurrency trading hamster, Mr. Gox? Mr. Gox's performance beat the US Stand and Pause 500 returns of 10.9%. Mr. Gox was a hamster who ran through a buy or sell tunnel inside his office to select which cryptocurrency he'd like to trade. Now, I wonder how the traders gave Mr. Gox any feedback. The lack of feedback clearly didn't affect his performance. In fact, feedback is so often badly handled that it damages performance rather than helps it. And I see that especially with unsolicited feedback, which is, more often than not, just an overflowing of ego to somewhere that it's not required. Well, feedback is information about a person's performance of a task. The intention should be to improve future performance. And for that intent to be met, the feedback needs to be wanted, accepted, understood and acted on. And if the feedback doesn't meet those four conditions, it can't be effective. If it's ineffective, what was the point other than aforementioned overflowing of ego? Are introverts any different when it comes to receiving feedback? Well, no and yes. Introverts don't need wrapping up in cotton wool. Being introverted doesn't make us shy, timid, unconfident wallflowers. However, the way many introverts think involves internal validation. To be effective, you'll need to get them to reflect on what the elements of a great job are. In other words, help them to break that down and then help them to consider their performance against those elements. But let's move on to something lighter. I've talked about humour a lot recently, whether it's office banter, introvert jokes, or simply ways to engage team meetings more effectively. But what is humour? How could you use it, whether you're introverted or extroverted? I turn to one of my favourite MCs and humour coach, Jeremy Nicholas. <laughs> Welcome, Jim. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, really good, thank you. I'm always a bit alarmed when people introduce me as someone funny because then people think, oh, he's going to be really funny. And they expect sort of Michael McIntyre type levels of laughs. And actually, I'm more sort of a smiley type person, really. For me, the humor is always the bonus rather than being the, the whole reason for being there. 
You know what? I think that's why I so like watching you on stage. You don't get up on stage and do stand up. I mean, I'm sure you could if you wanted to, but it's just the way you are as an MC. You'll see humour in something that's going on, and you might you might highlight it to us, which I I really appreciate. I have tried stand up and I didn't do very well at it. And there's two reasons. One is I'm not disciplined enough to learn 20 minutes and do it exactly the same every night because my mind wanders. And so that's why I like emceeing, because you can then play with stuff. And the other thing is that for me, the laughs are never the main thing. For me, it's the icing on the cake. And I'm all about the content, which is about how to communicate with impact. And incidentally, I'll teach you about humour. But for me, it's not all about getting laughs. If, if I get three laughs in a 45 minute keynote and they've got the message, I'm happy. I have no doubt that in a few minutes time, we're going to plunge into what is funny and, and stuff around there and, and perhaps touching on where that overlaps with introversion. But just before we do that, are you an introvert, an extrovert? And what's that mean to you? Yeah, I think I am an introvert. And the reason I think I am is because I get worn out when I'm with people all day. So if I'm at a wedding, I'm absolutely shattered by the end of the day. Or if I'm at a three day conference and I've been chatting to people all day and then in the evening, people want to stay up really late drinking in the bar, I have to go to a quiet space. So often if I'm at a three day conference, I'll go and have a swim in the hotel pool because I just need a break from people and then come back refreshed and be jolly because I'm, I'm known as a humorous speaker. I can't afford to sit in a bar not talking to people because I'm worn out because I need to be a bit of a laugh because that's my brand. Really interesting. Yeah, because there's a great, great tip in there as well, for particularly for introverts and conferences. Get well, away go, and recharge. Get away. Yeah. Get away. The, that's the thing. Some people, extroverts, they're just energised by everyone around them. And they love being, you know, what, what we're going to do now? Where are we going? You know, always wanting to go on to the next thing with the group. And I'm always thinking, yeah, I love the group. I really like everyone here, but I just need a little bit of quiet time just to have a think. And then half an hour later, I'll be back, raring to go. And they go, well, where were you? We missed you. And I go, oh, yeah, sorry. I just had to pop out for a call. But actually, I've just been lying on my bed thinking <laughs> in my room and then come out again. But you can't say that because they'll think you're mad. So I just thought, oh, yeah, sorry, I had a call. Well, I know at least a third of the people in the audience would be going, yeah, completely with that because they're <laughs> introverts and they'll, they'll understand it. But over the last few weeks, I've been talking a lot about introvert jokes on the podcast. There was a thing about banter, but what I'd love to know from your side, what is humour? What makes humour funny, I guess? So the one thing you need to know about analysing humour is that it's not very funny. It's like dissecting a frog in that you find out how it works, but you the frog dies. And that's what happens with humour when you analyse it. But it's different things to different people. Some people say it's tragedy plus time. So, you know, you can talk about bad stuff, but because it was a while ago, people will laugh. And some, some say it's a relief because you're talking about bad things that have happened. Or like if you see someone, one of the earliest jokes that you'd ever, as a kid, get in a comic, be someone slipping on a banana skin. And the reason you laugh at that is because you're relieved it's not you slipping on the banana skin. So it's like that sense of superiority. That, that's one of the things that humour is. Another thing would be truth and we just say it like it is. If I come in to an event and it's been lashing it down with rain and I come in soaking wet and I just say, is it wet enough for you? You know, and everyone will think, well, they're just glad that they're not wet. And also it's it's a common thing that we're all sharing. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely lashing it down with rain. So it's bringing into the conversation something common, but perhaps doing it in a, in a way that highlights something which people are trying to avoid, like it's yeah, soaking wet or whatever. That's probably what you call observational comedy. So someone like Billy Connolly, Jasper Carrot started all of that. And now it's the, the Michael McIntyre's jimmy carr type people and they say have you ever noticed that or why is it that and it's just irritating things in real life that other people whoever you're telling the joke to whether it's an audience or whether it's just a one-on-one -on -one with somebody else they think oh yeah I've, I've noticed that so if it's a shared experience that they feel better about it because you've noticed it as well i guess the thing with that is that because it's a shared experience because there is no butt of the joke if i can put it like that there is no line, because I, I guess with some humour, there's a line where you can get so close to it and it's funny and a tiny millimetre further and you've, you've crossed it. But where you're just observing stuff, I guess you can't really cross the no, line. No, observational stuff tends to be gentler. A lot of humour there is is quite cruel, where you're laughing at somebody. And this is something over the years where one group of people have laughed with another group of people at a third group of people. And then that can cruel now my rule with anything i ever say is will anyone in the audience feel threatened by it 
you know, am I just picking on them because of who they are? And so I won't do that. When I think about banter, perhaps just what people will chat around in teams and some of it is a bit funny, some of it might be slightly cruel and it's just, well, it was only banter. Mm. As soon as you got to defend it like that, well, it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. I think certainly in British culture, there is this culture of having banter with people where basically you're just being very rude, but it's all right because you know them. And then they'll say something very rude back, but it's all right because they're your mate and they know you. But the trouble is when you then do a banter with someone you don't know very well and they don't like it. Or if there's people from different cultures where they just think, well, those British people just seem to be insulting each other all the time. And then when we start insulting overseas people who don't understand that's what we do, then there's problems. Yeah, absolutely. So that you have to look at other people's cultures. I mean, I, I work in the Middle East. I work in South Africa. And, you know, if I did some of the stuff I did in the UK, they would just think I was being very rude. Now, I'll never do anything racist or sexist or homophobic or anything like that. But just ordinary comments would be perceived as being very cruel, for example, in the Middle East or, or Americans, where they don't get that that's what we do all the time. Okay. They would just think, hmm, I'm not sure he's the person I want to speak at my conference because he seems a bit cruel. So I, I make sure I would never do that to an international audience, but I might do it to a UK audience a bit. But again, not so that anyone in the room would feel threatened by anything. So, so no, I don't like cruelty. I, just, I don't think it's funny. Is using humour a good way, perhaps for introverts or for anybody, I guess, to ease themselves and get themselves a place in the conversation? Forget the stage bit, but just a normal conversation? Yeah, so humour is always a good way of getting to know people. I always say that a laugh is the shortest distance between two people. If you meet someone, say, at a networking event and you're having a coffee, and that's for introverts, that's often the worst moment, isn't it? It's in the break. And you're standing there and you think, I don't know anyone. Who am I going to talk to? If you just can say something fairly lighthearted, maybe comment on something that a speaker said on the stage or something in the brochure or just something in the room that you can see, if you can make a lighthearted comment about that, that often will break down barriers. They talk about people do business with who you know, like and trust, but actually liking often is because someone's fun to be with. I think being funny is important, but more important is to be fun. It's almost like having an open stance. If you're being fun and funny, people are going to think, oh, he looks like someone that I'd like to chat to. So observing, obviously, is a way that an introvert or anybody else could ease into that conversation. But are there any tips that you'd give introverts so they could use humour in a conversation without getting all extrovert and all pushy-pushy? And- yeah, so just be yourself and tell funny, but don't try and be funny. So just concentrate on your words. Tell a a true funny story rather than a joke. Don't tell jokes because people instantly, if you say, oh, here's a joke I heard the other day, instantly that puts pressure on the other person. They might have heard it before. They might not get it. They might not find it funny. You might mess up the punchline. You might mess up the setup so the punchline then isn't funny. All of those things put pressure on. But if you just drop in a funny story, oh, this happened, but don't say it was a funny story. So it's a surprise at the end when it is funny, then that's going to work very well. Because if they don't laugh, they've still had the story. When I say a story, it might just be something like, oh, on the, on the way here, I saw this. Without putting you on the spot, can you give us an example? Yeah, so I will often think about funny signs I've seen, billboard signs or things I've heard on the radio. And I'll say, oh, I heard on the radio and say this and I'll... I say it made me laugh because or I'll mention something that someone in my family said don't go for jokes you could comment on something in the news like you know if Boris Johnson has messed up a speech because he forgot his notes and he's talking about Peppa Pig as he did recently then you might you might say to someone would be have you been to Peppa Pig world <laughs> you know that and they would assuming that they've read the newspapers and seen the news they'll say no I haven't wasn't it awful what Boris did if they, ha- if they haven't done all that and they go, no, I don't have children, then <laughs> you've got to do a bit more work. But you haven't set it up as being funny, so you haven't got a letdown and therefore you don't have to feel embarrassed, I guess. Exactly, the yeah. the point about that's the, not that's, telling jokes. That's yeah. the thing. It, putting jokes, it just think it puts pressure on. Just do a whimsical line. But ideally, don't plan it too much so that you don't look like you really care about it. I think a lot of people are put off if someone's, does da 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 and then almost does jazz hands on the punchline. Da-da! Because if someone does that to me, I'll think, okay, yeah, fine. 
and what that's saying is you must find this funny and it's yeah. putting pressure on well the other person obviously but but ultimately on you i guess yeah i always think if you don't get a laugh just move on i, I don't like it when people go oh come on don't you get it mm. what's wrong with you don't make it my problem so good ways use observation of humor drop it into a conversation you found it interesting you found it amusing if nobody else does fine keep talking move yeah on. and don't be afraid to be clever i think a lot of people go they dumb down a bit when they try and be funny and they become a clown don't do that because as soon as you become a clown they'll be laughing at you and you don't want them laughing at you you want them laughing with you so keep a high status be a wit tell a story that if they like it fine if they don't fine it's still a story at the end of it if you've become a clown and then when you say can i give you my business card who's going to want a business card from a clown with a big red nose and floppy feet and doors that fall off their car before we go what i'd love to do is to ask you for a tip for an introvert perhaps to use humor more so because i work a lot with international speakers a lot of speakers are introverts perhaps be surprised to hear that but i'd say more than half of speakers are introverts and they're worried about using humor because you know they think supposing you don't get a laugh so my big tip is use funny pictures so if you're doing a slide presentation loads of people will do presentations you don't have to be a professional speaker but just put three or four funny pictures in there and you can either put memes that you've found on the internet about topical things uh, don't use cartoons because someone owns the copyright for that but the best of all, just take funny pictures. I take funny pictures of my dog. Or when I'm out for a walk, if I see something funny, sign or something, I'll take a picture of it. And just drop those in. If, for example, I was going to Edinburgh to give a talk, I would make sure that the opening slide would be a picture of Edinburgh saying, oh, I noticed this today on Princess Street. And instantly the audience warmed to me because I'm talking about where they are. And I perhaps do a funny story about it. I remember once there's a, the Scott Monument on the main street in Edinburgh, and it looks a bit like Thunderbird 1. And so I just put that on and I said, you know, it looks like it's ready for takeoff. A few people laughed and most of the Edinburgh people thought, yeah, everyone says that Thunderbird 1, yeah, it's not. It's our most famous monument. Don't take the mickey out of it, you Englishman. Whether they love it or hate it, it it's something. And I guess that, that works for both introvert and extrovert because it's relatively low-key again. It's, it doesn't require any performance skills and it doesn't generate any kind of anxiety because they'll either like it or they don't and you move on you know you can move on very quickly big thing then overall is if you want to be funny in inverted commas don't try and be funny use observational humor use pictures and, and keep it low key yeah the big takeaway if you want it in a bite-sized tip is tell funny don't act funny fantastic gem how can people get back in touch with you my website's jeremynicholas.co.uk on there, anyone that goes to there, they can have a free download of my book, which is called A Million Tips on Public Speaking, back at volume one, because there's not exactly a million tips in there. That's just a legal disclaimer. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Really You're welcome. Appreciate Thanks, it. John. What would you like to know about introversion in business? This week's question comes from Michelle, who wants to know, are introverts more aloof. No. There we go. That was simple, wasn't it? Although many people think they are. The assumption is because introverts prefer communicating with fewer people in greater depth and their stereotypical dislike of small talk with a group of people. And that can, of course, make company meetings, team meetings, group gatherings or networking harder for introverts. Some may come across as aloof because they know their preferences and they're not bothered by what others think. But more likely, well, in fact, let me just tell you a story. I would be in a group of people at a meeting and we'd all be chatting. And as my people energy started to dwindle a bit, I had two choices, leave the meeting or stand to the back of the little huddle. So what did I do? I stood off. How does that come across? Slightly aloof. When the extroverts are doing their talk to think bit and they're all chatting away, I'm sitting there processing and thinking about the subject. So a minute or so later, I might come in with a more detailed answer. How might that be interpreted? A bit superior? A bit aloof? Doesn't mean I am. It's just the way different people think. So, Michelle, no introverts are not more aloof, but be wary of appearances.
So what question would you like answered on the show? Whether you want to be on the show or just have your question answered, go to activateyourintrovert.co.uk where there's a box for you to ask your question. Also, you could follow on Facebook and discuss the answers at the show's page, Activate Your Introvert. I'm John Baker. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. There's a new episode every Thursday at activateyourintrovert.co.uk and your favourite podcast provider. Till then, go be introversial. Activating your introverts, building your business. Your business.